Welcome to Concord Matters, a show seeking for concord, agreement in Christian confession. Concord mattered to Jesus and Paul, and so it does to us also. Spend these next 60 minutes as we talk matters of Concord. Concord Matters, a program produced by the Christ-centered leader in confessional broadcasting. Worldwide KFUO, online at KFUO.org. Welcome to Concord Matters this week. Uh, coming to you from KFUO AM Radio, coming to you actually remotely from up in Cheyenne, Wyoming. I'm this week's host, Pastor Joshua Shear, Senior Pastor at Our Savior Lutheran Church here in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Beautiful day out today, sunny on the high plains, a little bit of smoke in the air from the very uh, fires. So, we are uh, getting into the Apology of the Oxford Confession still, but we're booking on through it as the last couple months have picked up our pace. And so we are covering today Article 20 of the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, which is on the topic of good works, uh, which we'll do a couple things with that when we get to this. First, I want to introduce our guests, however, today. Uh, we have our first guest. He's a regular guest with me. Uh, uh, Seems to do a wonderful job of confessing the faith here on Concord Matters. So Pastor Mike Grevy, pastor of Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Golden, Illinois. Pastor Grevy, good to have you with us again. Good to be with you this afternoon, Pastor Shear. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Always glad to have you. Uh, and then we have the optimistic Lutheran, uh, that is Pastor uh, Andrew Preuss, who's pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church in Gutenberg, Iowa, and St. Paul Lutheran Church in McGregor, Iowa. Uh, pastor Preuss, are you with us? Yeah, I'm here. Good to be with you. Are you as optimistic as ever? Yeah, I'm always optimistic, unlike you. But, you know. <laughs> We're doing a little joking. Uh, we, we, we did uh, kind of uh, debating topics at a conference this last spring, and he was supposed to be the optimist, and I was supposed to be the pessimist. So that's what you're catching on to. Uh, let's get into the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. So this is, again, defending the Lutheran, the Scripture faith that we have against the confutation that is the problems that the Roman Catholic theologians had with the Augsburg Confession. So uh, last time, uh, I guess they covered up through, like, around 85 or so. So we're going to try to just do a little backtrack to 83 through 85 to review it quick to see this, that, you know, the Roman Catholic theologians just out outright reject uh, our teaching that good works do not merit forgiveness of sins, and how this uh, from Melanchthon as he's writing the Apology is just like, how, what else can you say? This is this is crazy talk on their part. They've they've just blasphemed Jesus, and and there's so much of this stuff. So, so I'm gonna I'm gonna start here at paragraph 83. We see that a horrible decree has been prepared against us, which would terrify us still more if we were arguing about doubtful or silly subjects. Our consciences understand that the adversaries condemn the clear truth, whose defense is necessary for the church and increases Christ's glory. Therefore, we easily look down on the terrors of the world, and we will bear with a strong spirit all suffering for Christ's glory and the church's benefits. Who would not joyfully die in the confession of these articles that we receive the forgiveness of sins through faith freely for Christ's sake, and that we do not merit the forgiveness of sins by our works? The consciences of the pious will not have sure enough comfort against the terrors of sin and of death, and against the devil tempting with despair, if they do not know that their confidence lies in the forgiveness of sins freely for Christ's sake. This faith sustains and enlivens hearts in that most violent conflict with despair. All right, so just to just to go back there and show, you know, so, so in response to the Lutherans, the Roman Catholics have decided that they're going to bear the sword. They are going to uh, punish the Lutherans uh, and indeed persecute them. And that's what we see happening here. That's what they're talking about. But we see here uh, the Lutherans, uh, they're not too concerned about it. Um, I, I, this this great uh, thing, Pastor Grevy, what kind of, I mean, this is beautiful in that, you know, well, you know, this would be, this would really terrify us if we were talking about doubtful or silly arguments, silly, ar silly subjects. I mean, what's, what's at stake here? Why are they so confident? What's at stake here is salvation itself, uh, the, the very doctrine of salvation and how we are saved and rescued uh, from death and the devil and the terrors of our own consciences that plague us, and uh, that anything less than full and 
free forgiveness and justification by God for the sake of Jesus' uh, atoning death on the cross. Um, anything less than that is compromising the truth. And so, um, you know, the, the reason that uh, they can confess here, as we do, that uh, we could joyfully die in this confession is that uh, it's a little bit remindful of what Paul says in when he says, uh, uh, to me, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Uh, that uh, it will be a gain if we, if we have to die for this confession uh, of these articles, which we cannot compromise on and will not capitulate on and, uh, and joyfully won't capitulate on. We, we steadfastly uh, uphold them and stick to them and defend them. It's it's an absolute beautiful thing, you know. Uh, the commandments define what a good work really is, you know, what it is actually to do, uh, you know, and it's summed up in loving God, loving your neighbor, and so forth. And yet here you see it. Their actual concern in paragraph eighty five and following there is is isn't necessarily for them, their lives, or anything like that. Their concern is for other people, for their consciences, for their faith, for their being able to fight against the terrors of sin and death and so forth. Yeah. So again, in in the in the article defending our, our stance on good works, you see them actually doing a good work in confessing the faith for the good of the neighbor. And, and so you see this beautiful interaction that goes on there. You also see the great uh, comparison, you know, they're, they're kind of like shrugging off the threats of temporal violence towards them. And then, of course, they talk about uh, the most violent conflict with despair. And now we'll get into this in a little bit, but Pastor Preuss, can you talk about this most violent conflict with despair? Yeah, well, I mean, this this brings to mind uh, Ephesians 6, where Paul says that our, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the cosmic powers of this dark age, um, that is, against the devil and his forces. And, uh, you know, they're, they're really studying the record straight that, you know, they, they, can, they can come at them with physical force, but they're, they, they don't fear the one who can kill the body but not the soul. They fear God who can destroy both in hell. And, uh, and, and they, they recognize that, you know, it, it, it also reminds me of, um, when Jacob is coming back from, uh, from Padan Aram and he's meeting his, uh, he's, he's meeting his, his brother Esau and he's afraid. He's afraid of Esau and what Esau will do to him. So God, in order to teach him not to be afraid of men, comes in the form of a man and wrestles with him and fights him all night. And, uh, and he, he forces him to fight with God, to strive with God. And then, of course, he, he holds him down and says, I won't let you go until you bless me. And that's what they're doing here. They're, they're striving with God. And they're saying, if our, if our conscience is clear toward God um, through the blood of Christ, then we have nothing to worry about. But if our conscience is not clear toward God, um, then this is, you might as well kill us, basically. You know, it, 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 then there's, there's uh this is the worst thing that we can possibly have is is to not have a good conscience um toward our toward our father in heaven so so how much of this relates pastor Preuss? i mean we live in a day and age where where there's such a thing as what they call virtue signaling which is you know i'm making sure that everyone else knows that i'm good you know that that you know it, it seems like almost comes out of a fear of men that we have to try to go out of our way to make sure that they know that you know we're we're okay is that all related to this yeah, I mean, I think so. That there's uh, I mean, when we talk about good work, I mean, you you touched on it there that they're actually doing a good work here and being concerned about the conscience of their brethren and of of the faithful. And when so when we talk about good works, you know, there there's two ways to look at good works. And Jesus explains this in his Sermon on the Mount um, when he tells us to do our good works in secret. And uh, that isn't to say that. No one's ever going to see our good works. In fact, he does say that, that the faithful will see them and recognize them and give glory to God. But this, the, but but if your if if your if your uh, your goal is for people to see your good works, um, then you're not doing them in faith. You're not doing them with. You're not you're not concerned about the Father who sees in secret um, rewarding you. You're rather trying to seek your reward right now. And Jesus says, you know, the hypocrites um, <clears throat> who. Uh, who pray for others to see them pray, um, they have their reward. They have it right now. And God will let you have your reward if you want it right now, just like the, the prodigal son's father 
let him have his inheritance. He wanted it right then. He said, okay, go ahead and take it. Um, but, but God's rule for us is to despair of ourselves um, and of our own works and instead find the true, the true work, which begins with faith in God's mercy. And from there, true good works uh, proceed. And so it really does prevent us from this uh, kind of virtue signaling. And, you know, there's a, you know, to get into kind of a, a little bit of a bunny trail here, there's a difference then between witnessing to the truth of Christ, making a good witness, um, and and, and uh, in, in good Christian outreach uh, with the gospel, there's a big difference between that on the one hand and uh, publicity on the other. And I think often um, well-meaning Christians often fall into this uh, this this trap of thinking that they're that they're making a witness to the world, but really they're just virtue signaling, and they're 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 concerned more with public re- public relations and publicity. Um, but see, the difference between that is that the one gives glory to God, um, despite what the world says, and uh, the other is trying to find glory in this world. Yeah, it's it's like you know, it's like the church is always trying to give the world what the world wants, which is just not a not a good thing at all. Mm-hmm. Um, nah, not a good thing. But it's really profound, and and it has a lot to do with with how individuals act, and it should be, of course, a matter of reflection for them. But also organizations um, and how they and how they interact with the world and, and yeah try to try to win the world over um, or at least have the world think really good things of them or it's it's strange um, never mind the world that, that that is the world that crucified Christ so um, that's just how it's going to be um, let's get into the, the following uh, paragraphs here 86 and following I'll read 86 through 88 and then we can discuss this. The cause is so worthy that we should refuse no danger. To every one of you who has agreed to our confession, do not yield to the wicked, but on the contrary, go forward with the more boldly. Do not yield when the adversaries, by means of terrors and tortures and punishments, try hard to drive away from you that comfort presented to the entire church in our article. Those seeking scripture passages to settle their minds will find them. As the saying goes at the top of his voice, Paul cries out that sins are freely forgiven for Christ's sake. It depends on faith, he says, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed. If the promise were to depend upon our works, it would not be sure. If forgiveness of sins were to be given because of our works, when would we know that we had received it? When would a terrified conscience find a work that it would consider enough to reconcile God's anger? We spoke fully about this entire matter before. The reader can get the references there. The unworthy presentation of the subject has forced us not to discuss but complain. They have clearly gone on record as disapproving of our article that we receive forgiveness of sins not because of our works, but through faith and freely because of Christ. All right. <clears throat> Pastor Grevy, again, this is, you know, uh, be bold. Do not yield to the wicked, but on the contrary, go forward more boldly. What does this look like today when we do have, uh, when we do have such perversions and such a, uh, more open hostility towards the church? What does this mean today? Well, it means in part that we, we ever more certainly and surely uh, cling to Christ and none other, to the blood of Christ that was shed for our sins and is the ransom price paid for us, and that uh, we know that when we uh, eat and drink the body and blood of Jesus, that uh, sins are forgiven uh, by faith on account of Christ, on account of his sacrifice for us on the cross, and that that we would put no confidence in salvation by works. Um, and as you were reading that, I was thinking, it, you know, at the same time, it's, um, uh, there is uh, this temptation, sometimes it's uh, unintentional, uh, to kind of meld the law and the works and works together in such a way as to make it sound like, well, since we can't be saved by works, that must mean that we can also eschew the law and just and just kind of do away with it and push it off to the side uh certainly not um you know paul makes it clear that the promise uh, the promises are not against the law uh they rather we don't uh do away with the law rather the law is confirmed 
we are not saved accord- by the works of the law, but we most certainly need the law. And uh, it is, you know, as you were mentioning earlier, uh, we pretty clearly, we very clearly are given the definition of good works uh, by what's contained in the Ten Commandments according to our various vocations into which we're called. And so, but um, the salvation itself, the assurance of that and the certainty against a perverted uh, generation and a perverse generation in which we, which we currently also, of course, live in, is only um, clinging to Christ and his sacrifice and the good news of his death and resurrection for, for all of our sins, uh, that uh, he's not going to leave us and forsake us uh, because uh, our works are not good enough. Uh, in fact, his work is the all-sufficient work that has atoned for everything and, and brought us to our Father in heaven, uh, and we have access to him through Christ. Amen. Yeah, Pastor Grieve brings up a great point there. Um, it's actually, you know, Augsburg 20, when you go back to it, that's one of the first things the Roman Catholics have done. They're accusing the Lutherans of forbidding good works, of, of getting rid of good works, and of course that's not going to be true. But of course, in, in Lutheran history, we do find groups of people at times who uh, abused the gospel, uh, perverted the gospel, didn't understand the gospel uh, in relation to how it works with works and, and the law and so forth, and, and, and kind of throw away the law. And That's not at all what the scriptures say. That's not at all what our confessions say. That's not what Lutherans believe. And so we see that. Um, he references uh, Galatians 3, which, of course, would have been, if you're in the one-year lectionary, uh, would have been our epistle lesson on Sunday uh, this past week. And so uh, there's your advertisement for the one-year lectionary. Um, every everyone, every parish should be on the one-year. It's a great lectionary. It lets you read Luther, Chemnitz, and all these guys, uh, our fathers, uh, that we can that we can learn to them and we can have our hearts turn to them like uh, like John the Baptist turned the hearts of the fathers to the sons and the sons to the fathers. So, great stuff. Uh, Pastor Pastor Preuss, you know, it says here, to, to drive away from you the comfort presented to the entire church in our article, again, they're emphasizing their love for the entire church, that this confession is not a private thing, it's a, for everybody. But then it says, those seeking scripture passages to settle their minds will find them. Just off the top of your head, what are some scripture passages that just teach us about this, the fact that salvation, justification is by faith, by or by grace, as, as Ephesians 2 would put it, uh, and not of works, just off the top of your head. Well, the one that they that they quote in there when they say that Paul Paul yells this, uh, shouts this out, is that it is by faith that it may be by grace that that the promise may be guaranteed to all of Abraham's offspring. Uh, Romans uh, four sixteen. And what's interesting, I kind of wanted to comment on the on the translation there. Um, the translation in our reader's edition is taken from the ESV, which says it depends on faith, which uh, I guess grammatically you could maybe take it that way, but really the 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 um, the, the the preposition there is ek, um, and uh, which which simply means by or from, and uh, and so so by means of, and so and if you look in the Latin there, they just say you know um, the same thing, you know ek. Today, you know, so it's by faith, or in the German, it's through faith. So, so I think that, that I wanted to just kind of point that out that this is, uh, it's not that our salvation depends on our act of believing, um, but rather it is by means of believing the promise that we are saved. And, and, uh, and of course, this faith then is active. Um, in, in, in good works. But, you know, other passages, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, as not of yourselves, the gifts of God, not by works of sin, you man should boast. Um, uh, John 15, Jesus says, apart from me, you, you can do nothing. Um, you know, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, Mark 16, 16. Um, you know, th- these, uh, uh, the, the, uh, Rome, the probably the clearest one, which really gets to the heart of it, is uh, Romans 4-5, uh, he who does not work but trusts in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned to him as righteousness. So, I mean, you have there, uh, you know, the formula of Concord in Article 3 talks about these uh, these uh, exclusive particles um, that is, uh, or, or are also known often as uh, prepositions, these uh, uh, things like without, you know, a part of, apart from. Um, and uh, so without work, um, and, and the fact that it says without works uh, is uh, 
is pointing out, is trying to make it as clear as possible that it's either by faith or it's by works, and you can't have both. And the Roman Catholics try to kind of bring them both together as, as if it's like faith plus works, uh, which they would call love and charity and other virtues. Um, uh, that, that, that that's what justifies us. But the scriptures are clear that if it is that that if work, if it is by works, as Paul says um, in Romans, I think Romans 11, I believe, then or is that Romans 14? Yeah, maybe yeah, 14. Um, the, the, if it is by grace, then it's no longer by works. And you know, of course, you know we can talk about how the Roman Catholics try to use those passages and say, well, that's talking about the beginning of it the beginning of justification, but in order to have a complete justification, you need to add your works. Well, then they're totally redefining what justification is. is either justification means that God justifies you, or it doesn't. So either it means that God forgives you your sins and declares you righteous, or it doesn't. And if it doesn't mean that, then we should stop calling it justification, but the, that's what the Bible called it. So so I think these passages are very clear um, that, uh, that, we, that our good works do not uh, advance us toward salvation. Excellent. And so it, it says here, you know, do not yield. Um, and, and, and yielding would, of course, create this uncertainty and doubt and so forth. Uh, you know, it, it's been over a decade plus now, um, but the ELCA and the Roman Catholic Church came together and they, they put together a joint declaration on the doctrine of justification. Uh, Pastor Preuss, I know um, I know your dad has worked on a lot, on this a lot I'm assuming you've probably talked to him a number of times about it. Is is that a yielding uh, when 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 the when the more liberal Lutherans decided that they were going to come together with Roman Catholics and agree on justification? Is yeah, that a yielding? I, yeah, absolutely. And um, I remember uh, uh, writing a paper for one of my dogmatics classes on this, and when, when I was in seminary, and I was I was looking. It was interesting because I, I I looked at uh, a couple different. Uh, writings by Roman conservative Roman Catholics who claimed that the Roman Catholic Church yielded on it. Um, but, of course, the Roman Catholic Church, what they did is they, they signed it, and then they went to their, their annex, which is kind of their official um, positions, and kind of clarified what they mean. And they kind of baptized it with their own papal stamp and, uh, and dogma. And, 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 but, but the Lutherans were left agreeing with the Roman Catholics by means of... Uh, by means of conceding to this understanding of the words of Scripture. So what they said was that we agree on the basic, uh, on, the, on, on kind of the basic truth of the gospel, that, that we are valuable to God, and, uh, and, and that the different, the various formulations don't matter as much. Well, that word, that code for formulations, that's re- so that, that term formulations is really code for uh, the, the words of Scripture, uh, which are not really, can't really be taken for what they are. And so, so it's, it, it's sort of like, uh, you know, back in one of the, the phrases, I think my dad even coined this, it was in his STM thesis, and he talks about this in his little book, Am I Good Enough for God?, uh, which you can buy at, uh, at uh, Northwest Publishing House. Just a tiny, really good book, 20-some pages long, very good track to give out to people to explain what justification is. But anyway, my dad pointed this out that, um, so back in the, back in the, you know, early parts of the 19th century, you had this, or 18th century, you had this guy, Rudolf Boltman, who was talking about how the Bible was written in myth. And so we need to demythologize it to get to the real meaning of it. And then when you get to the real meaning of it, it's really just a bunch of empty, Emptiness that is, that is has lost all its substance. So what my dad called this, what the, what the what they did with the joint declaration, this ecumenical kind of compromise, is what they did with the words of scripture is they 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 demetaphorized them. So that what they did is they talked about how justification by faith alone, apart from works, justification by faith alone, justification by faith with works, you know, uh, work faith and works. Um, you know, whether God declares us righteous or God makes us righteous through a process. They said these are all just metaphors of one b- basic truth that God loves us, you know. And so what they did right. is they demetaphorized it so that you're left with just something a Hindu could agree with. You know, if you go to a Hindu and you say, "Is God loving?" and they say, "Well, yeah, sure," but the question is, "Well, what does that mean?" You know, and John three sixteen doesn't say God loved the world. Period. It says, "No, God loved the world in this way that He gave His only begotten Son." So that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. 
So there is, that is the love of God. So if you just exactly. say, well, we all agree that God loves us, and then you say, well, this other, these so-called formulations don't matter, well, then you're compromising on the very words and work that God uses to explain how he loves us. Which is which is exactly what they what they did, and and so what, I mean that's that's what we're encouraging here in the confessions to stay strong to this. Uh, we have to take a hard break. Uh, we'll be back in a couple minutes. You're listening to Concord Matters on KFUO AM Radio. Hi, this is Pastor Mark Azil, the LCMS Director of Campus Ministry and the Chancellor of LCMSU, inviting you to join us right here on Wednesdays at 2 p.m. in the Student Union. If you can't make it, Student Union is always available as a podcast at kfuo.org. Learn more about LCMSU at lcmsu.org. And remember, college is tough. You need Jesus. We'll help. Wednesday afternoon at 2 on KFUO. Zika is still a threat, and its effect on an unborn child can be devastating. So we're taking our doctor's advice on how to protect our unborn baby from Zika birth defects. Let's keep stopping Zika. Visit cdc.gov slash prevent Zika. Mosquitoes can spread Zika, so wear insect repellent, long sleeve shirts, and long pants. Dump standing water and use window screens or AC. I'm not taking a chance with Zika. Let's keep stopping Zika. Visit cdc.gov slash prevent Zika. This message from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. This is the day which the Lord has made. For the lonely and homebound, for the grieving and dying, and for all those who are afflicted in body, mind, and spirit, especially for... Join us for a live broadcast of Chapel at the LCMS International Center weekdays at 10 a.m. on KFUO. Listening to KFUO on your smartphone is so easy to do. Smartphone assistant, play KFUO. Playing KFUO radio. You can also visit the place where you get your apps and download the KFUO app. You can also go to the KFUO homepage. Wow, the KFUO homepage is customized to fit your phone with an easy-to-find listening button. When you're on the webpage, you can browse for more information. You can listen to KFUO 24 hours a day at KFUO.org. Don't forget about Facebook, facebook.com slash KFUO radio. Now you're just acting like a Know it all. The real life story of William Tyndale is more dramatic than any novelist could pen. Betrayed by a friend, Tyndale was arrested for heresy by imperial authorities and imprisoned for over a year near Brussels. In 1536, William Tyndale was tried and convicted of heresy and treason. He was strangled and put to death, then burned at the stake. And the apparent reason? His English translation of the Bible. Tyndale published his first edition of the New Testament in 1526. He ultimately succeeded in finishing the Pentateuch, the Book of Jonah, and some of the books of the Old Testament before being arrested and executed in 1536. Printings of Tyndale's translations, among them a 1536 edition, are on display at Museum of the Bible. Engage with the Bible, this book of all books. Brought to you by Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. Welcome back to Concord Matters here on KFUAM Radio, the messenger of the good news. Uh, we were wrapping up in the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, Article 20. Uh, we were wrapping up some discussion before the break on the Joint Declaration of Doctrine, Doctrine of Justification, which happened between the ELCA and the Roman Catholic Church, in which the Lutherans kind of gave in um, and and so forth. But, of course, uh, Lutherans... Uh, Lutherans that adhere to the confessions, that is, have not given in, and so we still make the good confession uh, with boldness, uh, no matter what uh, situation may may warrant if we get if we get punished for it or not. So um, it says there, and we left off, uh, Pastor Grieve, I'm going to ask you this one. Um, we left off at paragraph, uh, well, we finished through 88, but I wanted to talk to you about this. Uh, we spoke fully about this entire matter before. The reader can get the references there. Uh, so just for our hearers' sakes, where else in the confessions are we going to find discussion of justification and, and, and so forth? 
In the Augsburg Confession, uh, for sure, it is uh, explained again and confessed very clearly there, namely how we are made right with God uh, by the means of grace, by means of grace uh, through the gift of faith uh, that's in Jesus. Uh, it's a gift of God. It's not uh, not of our not of our doing, uh, so that no one can boast uh, that it is by our doing. Uh, so it's very clearly confessed uh, in in the Augsburg Confession, uh, and and also uh, certainly comes out in other uh, of the confessional writings as well. Um, the uh, the treatise and. Uh, treatise of the power and primacy of the pope uh, it comes out uh, certainly there in various places um the large catechism uh, luther uh, certainly um has it in there it, it's in it's it's all over the place really but it's very you know it's clear, more most clearly and succinctly in the augsburg confession and then in its apology uh, which is what we're in the defense against the confutation the defense of justification by grace through faith uh, in Christ alone, for the forgiveness of sins alone. So um, that's that's where it's that's where it's been spoken about before in regards to that statement that you read there, because the Augsburg Confession was the document uh, that did precede uh, the Apology, which we're currently going through. Right. Yeah, and, and Melanchthon is making this point where he's like, you know, right. listen, we we've gone through this many times. Uh, if you want to find out more about it, go reference that stuff. So I'm thinking here on our show, um, you know, it took us months to get through the Apology Article 4, um, which is, you know, justification, and then, of course, love and so forth that flows, flows out of faith. Um, and then, of course, uh, I think we spent a couple months on, on Article 12 on repentance. But then you're right. It, it flows throughout the whole confessions. I mean, you can just see it underline everything, this idea of justification you know, this is why Luther calls it the central article um, in the Christian faith and so forth. Uh, so it's just, uh, yeah, it's it's all over in here, which is, of course, why Melanchthon deals with it by just saying, hey, look, look it up elsewhere. We've already gone through this. Uh, we've we've done this stuff. It's it's uh, it's been it's been done. So now let's uh, let's go into paragraph 89 and 90. Uh, and we discuss here speci specifically uh, one of the passages that the confutation used. It cited a, a couple of them, a couple of them from the Apocrypha, but here we're going to deal with the one from Second Peter. So paragraph 89 and 90. The adversaries also add references to their own condemnation, and it is worthwhile to provide several of them. They quote from Second Peter 1.10, Be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. Now you see, reader, that our adversaries have not wasted any effort in learning logic, but have the art of concluding whatever pleases them from the Scriptures. For they conclude, make your calling sure by good works. Therefore they think that works merit the forgiveness of sins. This is a very nice way of thinking. If one would argue this way about a person whose death sentence had been pardoned, the judge commands that from now on you stop stealing from others. Therefore you have earned the pardon from the punishment because you no longer s steal from others. To argue in this way makes a cause out of no cause. Peter speaks of works following the forgiveness of sins and teaches why they should be done. They should be done so that the calling may be sure. That is, they should fall, fall from their calling if they sin again. Do good works in order that you may persevere in your calling, in order that you do not lose the gifts of your calling. They were given to you before, and not because of the works that follow, and which now are kept through faith. Faith does not remain in those who lose the Holy Spirit and reject repentance, as we have said before. Faith exists in repentance. All right. So here is a bunch of different stuff, uh, including some a little bit of a, a little bit of jabs at the Roman Catholic theologians who have so blasphemed Christ by robbing uh, his work of salvation from him and, and giving it to the works of men. Uh, so here we we see here that they they add these the Second Peter one ten Pastor Preuss, if you would just kind of summarize some of what is discussed here. I mean, they they haven't wasted any effort in learning logic. So let's let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so the, basically the Roman Catholic uh, opponents are pointing to Second Peter chapter 1, uh, where Peter tells them to make your calling and election sure, and he goes on then to 
to, you know, Peter goes on to talk about supplementing your faith with, uh, with all sorts of good works. Um, and, uh, and so what they're saying is, well, okay, their logic is, is, uh, is kind of skewed here. It would be like if a, you know, a judge, uh, sets you free, uh, he pardons you, and then he commands you that you gotta stop stealing. Um, and then they, they then say, well, therefore, um, he's pardoned because he no longer steals. Like, well, no, that you're getting the cart before the horse. And so he makes it clear here that there is, uh, the forgiveness of sins is, uh, is the beginning, um, of good works. And, uh, and so the way he, he, the way that Melanchthon ex- expresses it here, then he kind of, kind of expounds on this passage from, from Second Peter. If he says, you know, do good works in order that you may persevere in your calling, and your calling being that you're called to the Christian life, um, to, to walk, to, to live by faith, walking in good works. And if you stop, so he's kind of explained it in sort of a negative way rather than a positive way, that you, if you stop doing good works, then you're falling from, from, your, from your calling, and you're falling from, from being a Christian. And it's like what, what Paul says, you know, he who does not take care of his relatives has denied the faith. You know, he just, by by doing that, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And so what's interesting about this passage, and this actually is um, one of the most significant passages for me in my kind of, my uh, uh, studies uh, since I was since I was uh, younger, um, uh, is I remember going into Dr. Stevenson's office when I was at St. Catherine's uh, in like my second year, and I was reading this, and I said to Dr. Stevenson, I don't know. I don't know if I can subscribe to the confessions right now. I don't know if I agree with what what Melanchthon's saying here. You know, because I was, I knew of course the uh, the issue about uh, that was addressed in Article Four of the Formula of Concord that said that uh, that 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 corrected the error that says that while faith brings us into in, into God's grace, good works help preserve us in, in in that grace. And it seems like Melanchthon is saying that. But see, well, then, then, uh, then I went to that article again, and I found that wow, I must have passed over this. They actually address exactly this part in the Apology, Article Twenty, or Article Twenty of Paragraph Ninety. And so they quote what you just read, and then the form of Concord goes on, and it says, "On the other hand, this does not mean that faith lays hold of the righteousness and salvation only in the beginning, and then resigns its office to works as though they had to sustain faith, the righteousness received in salvation." It means rather that the promise not only of the receiving but also of retaining the righteousness of salvation is firm and sure to us. And then he goes on to, to quote some Bible passages, one of them from First Peter uh, chapter 1 that says that by God's power, namely the gospel, you are being guarded through faith for salvation. So, there's, so I think the distinction here that we have to draw is that Melanchthon uses the word persevere. He does not use the word preserve yourself. Right, it, it, you persevere. Persevering means that you're doing your duty while trusting in God, and you are doing, you are living the life that God has called you to live. And if you stop persevering, then it follows that you're going to deny the faith. But there's a big difference between saying that and saying that these good works are actually preserving you. No, only the Word of God, the Gospel, the grace of God, the power of God in Christ continues to preserve your faith. And so we we should make that uh, that clear distinction. Um, uh, and to rightly understand what he's saying here, that, that he's, he's talking about persevering, bearing your cross, live, you know, following Christ, you know, uh, striving to, to please God. And if you no longer want to please God, that simply means that you aren't a Christian. That means that you have fallen from faith. And so Peter gives this admonition to supplement your faith with good works so that you are not um, so you're not losing sight of what God has called you uh, to do as a Christian. And uh, so, and another thing to point out too, uh, in um, Peter's list there, and I don't have it right in front of me, but he, you know, the things that he's listing are not a bunch of outward do-goody kind of works. Um, they're virtues, right? Virtue, godliness, self-control, those kinds of things. And 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 so these. So, the, so what he's teaching here, what, the, what this passage is teaching here, is that faith bears fruit. It bears spiritual fruit. And if you deny those fruits, then you're denying faith. And, that, and that's, that's really the point that's being made here. Exactly. The list is uh, the list is is rather long. It says, you know, adding to your faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness. 
kindness and then of course uh love and then mm-hmm. uh, you know those all those things yeah that this is not yeah could I add one thing uh, to that? Uh, to what, yes, Pastor Greeby. Uh, Pastor Preuss has said, and just it, and what you've said there, uh, you know, there's a little bit of an overlap. It seems there with the virtues and the fruit of the spirit that Paul talks about uh, in Galatians, and then also it's interesting right before that verse that Second uh, Peter one ten that they try to quote in proof of making your uh, call and calling an election sure by virtue of the works is that Peter says uh, in verse 9, For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. So part of the da- the real danger there is forgetting that you were justified. And that's really what Peter, I think, you know, right in verse 9 is that he's forgetting that your, your sins have been, you're forgetting that your sins have been forgiven. And if you're forgetting that, it's along the same lines as Pastor Preuss uh, was saying, if you don't want to please God anymore, you're really denying the faith. And uh, so that's really the, the danger is, is for, in, you know, in, and so it comes full circle again, forgetting that you're justified. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, he says that even, even going farther back uh, in Peter's epistle, in verse, uh, verse 1, you know, he says, uh, you know, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, I mean, yeah. that is as clear of a passage you're going to get, that by faith we have the righteousness of God, and it's not any different than the faith that the apostles had. Right. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. That's, that's very good distinctions to keep making. Um, on, on a simpler note, you know, here we see a very clear statement, again, of the Lutheran Confessions, that indeed people can lose their salvation. Um, and this is, of course, over and against some some errors that have been propagated in the church, uh, yeah. which should not be tolerated in the Church of God. That you know, once saved, always saved. That kind of stuff, mm-hmm. or, or of the the Calvinistic, you know, hyper predestination type stuff, um, right. where it just you know doesn't matter. You know, well, that's that's not what the scriptures teach either. Right. And in the same way, you know, for the attitude that would look at good works and say they don't matter. Well, that's kind of a really risky attitude to take. Yeah, uh, yeah. Do like that idleness, you know. When I mean, I think we all we've all, we all have, as pastors have uh, experienced this. I'm sure that someone comes to church and wants to take the Lord's Supper, and you ask, "Well, where do you where do you attend church? Are you going to a church that's teaching the truth? You know, that agrees with what we teach?" And and they say something like, "Well, no, but I was baptized and confirmed here." You know, mm. and so there's this idleness that uh, you know that that, that is being um, rebuked in this passage of uh, of the apology. That you know you can't you can't have you can't say that you have faith um, if you are refusing to do your duty. And part of your duty is to gather around with the other Christians. Kind of going full, full circle with what you were talking about before. That his concern is the other Christians. It's love for the brethren. Yeah. Right. Do not forsake the gathering together, right? As Hebrews right. would put it. <clears throat> yeah. All right. Let's uh, let's move in and let's finish out this article here. Uh, paragraphs ninety one and ninety two. They add other references that make no more sense. Finally, they say that this opinion was condemned a thousand years before in Augustine's time. This also is quite false. For Christ's church always held that the forgiveness of sins is received freely. Indeed, the Pelagians were condemned. They argued that grace is given because of our works. Besides, we have shown above well enough that we hold that good works should follow faith. Do we then overthrow the law, asked Paul? On the contrary, we uphold the law, because when we have received the Holy Spirit through faith, the fulfilling of the law necessarily follows. Patience, chastity, and other fruit of the Spirit gradually grow by this love. And there you have the reference, uh, as Pastor Grieby was talking about, uh, uh, the fruit of the Spirit as well, that the good works flow out from a living faith and so forth. Uh, Pastor Preuss, um, they did, the in the, in the uh, confutation, I put out a copy of it here in front of me, um, they're they're going to quote Tobit, um, something about you know almsgiving, of course, is an excellent offering in the presence of the Most High, mm-hmm. which is of course you know yeah making an offering is a good work. I mean when our parishioners 
uh, put their tithe in the plate, uh, at, that's a good work when done in faith. That yes, mm-hmm. this does support uh, the church and the preaching of the gospel and their neighbor of the pastor, but that good work doesn't justify them. Again, it's it simply just they they don't even understand why they're trying to quote these passages. And and so they talk again from Luke 11 about alms and and of course being alms that uh yeah, just they're they're misusing scripture over and over again, which of course uh, the confutation does over and over again. So so can you explain to me what it, what they're talking about here with this with this condemned a thousand years before? Yeah, well, I mean, Augustine has has uh, uh, addressed, you know, the this idea that you don't need to urge people toward good works, and uh, and Augustine really he really um, he really battled with it, you know. And there were there are some times when Augustine is kind of sounding like kind of a papist, you know. And uh, but but you, it's very evident throughout Augustine's writings, especially his spirit in the letter. Um, and his, his, his writings against Pelagian, uh, Pelagius, who was, um, uh, I think a British, I think he was from Britain, actually, uh, uh, but he was, a, he was a heretic who taught that we can, by our own natural powers, um, you know, attain the righteousness that, uh, that God requires. And he, he vehemently opposed Pelagian, Pelagian uh, uh, doctrine. And, uh, but, but Augustine would make comments about uh, how good works are, uh, you know, they're crowned with grace. You know they're crowned by God's grace and made worthy by God's grace, and and uh, and so he clearly is trying to work this out, and he he's not quite as articulate as Luther and Melanchthon and these other these other uh, Lutherans, um, and yet when you read Augustine, you can you can see that he he very much wants to avoid any type of uh, of merit based kind of uh, system where we are. Um, where, where we are uh, uh, somehow working our way up by our by our good works, and uh, so I mean he could speak of uh, giving alms, uh, and this is it's been a few years since I've read this, but in his Enchiridion, his Handbook on Faith, Hope, and Love, he'll speak of giving alms being kind of benefiting, uh, and he's not as clear. But see what 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 Luther and Melanchthon point out um, is uh, you know Luther talks about this in his large catechism. Or no, in the small called articles that, you know, that, 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 that Augustine would, he talked a lot and he, he would have, he'd maybe speculate a little bit on this or that. Um, but he never had this, this kind of elaborate, uh, merit system that the papacy instituted during the Middle Ages and kind of solidified in the Council of Trent, which is the council that, that was their response to the Reformation. Um, so, so, uh, so this is something that, uh, you know, we, I think we have to admit that the church fathers weren't always as clear. And sometimes they did even, uh, uh go too far and even, uh, include some, uh, good works. And there was some confusion on that. But when, if you compare it to what is being pushed by Roman Catholic dogma as we know it today and as we've known it for the last 500 or so years, it really can't be compared. Um, that, that they're, they're, uh, they're clearly, there's there is a clear attempt to to safeguard salvation from our own works, um, and, uh, and that that is that becomes very apparent in reading Augustine, even if he does kind of uh, not sound very Lutheran <laughs> uh, in everything yeah. that he says. Well, one of the one of the things I find in just reading whether you're reading one of the early church fathers who wrote a lot, like Augustine, or if you're reading Luther who wrote a ton, and mm-hmm. There's a lot of difference between reading Luther in 1516, 1517, and and so forth, versus reading Luther in 1538. Um, there's, yeah. there's just there's a lot of uh, uh, understanding that has been had has has occurred, more learning probably, or or understanding how like imprecise words can be misused against him. Those kind of things you start seeing in his later writings, uh, as he's kind of guarding against people misunderstanding what he's saying, and I think the same thing would be true of Augustine. Um, mm-hmm. But this is, of course, a good thing for a reminder for us why we're studying the Book of Concord, right? That, that, that a Lutheran, when we confess the faith, it's not 1517 we run back to for any kind of legacy. It's 1580. It's it's the Book of Concord. This is this is our Lutheran beliefs. This is what we confess as Lutherans. Um, uh, 
otherwise you go back to this imprecise language, which of course you know the last what the last year or two have been spent amongst all kinds of quote unquote Protestant denominations celebrating the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. Well, yeah, it's because you know, do the Baptists try to claim Martin Luther? Yeah, they try to at times, but are the Baptists Lutheran? Not even close. So, same kind of things happening here. I think um, we see this happen. And yeah, Pelagius was was a British guy, um, heretic. Um, he freely taught that you know, yep, works are what justify you. Works uh, earn the forgiveness of sins. And of course, that's pretty blatant. So you don't run into that a lot of times. Pastor Greeby, what we just have a few minutes here. Mm-hmm. Um, what kind of stuff do you find though? I mean, we don't usually find people that are as blatant as Pelagius. We find kind of this. Uh, you know, oh well, you know, you you Jesus maybe gets you started and you finish it. That's kind of more of the Roman Catholic line nowadays, mm-hmm. right? Or or you find maybe the, you know, you got to do just your part. You know, Jesus does ninety percent, you do ten. That right. kind of stuff. What right. what do we what do we see with that? Yeah, what's God, our counter to that? Yeah, God helps those who help themselves. That, that kind of a that kind of a thing too. Yeah. Um, yeah, in some ways that's uh, even more, more, well, it is more deceptive and more dangerous because the, the, there's a lot of talk of grace and, and speaking about it and so forth, And uh, but there's more of a commingling than with these, these other things, you know, and as small as they might be, it's, it's a it's a deceptive thing, you know, you've got something then, you know, that you comes out of full-blown Pelagianism is the the semi-Pelagianism, you know, that came, that came out of it too. So, yeah, it's, um, you know, we've got a, you know, again, it draws us back to the full-throated, clear confession that we hold to, that it's, that it really is, uh, by grace alone, full and free, uh, nothing added to that in any way, shape, or form whatsoever. Not a little bit of works, uh, not a lot of works, not any works added to that grace, um, but works flow from faith, and the works flow from justification. As this closing sentence says in, in this article, it's, you know, because, you know, when we have received the Holy Spirit through faith, the fulfilling of the law necessary follows. And then you've got this beautiful, you know, and this is why, you know, the, the important distinction between justification and sanctification always needs to be kept as well is that we we grow in this, and that's exactly what it closes out with. Patience, chastity, and other fruit of the Spirit gradually grow by this love. So we don't reach perfect sanctification in this life that does ebb and flow uh, because, uh, because we're still sinners, but we do uh, very much so, and in a very real concrete way, grow by the aid of the Holy Spirit, grow in sanctification. Our justification is full and free. Our sanctification is is a growth that comes. And so we've just got to stick to that clear, full-throated confession that it's uh, that there's not uh, anything to be added to this grace at all. Yeah, and that's, that's a distinction. Lutherans are always about making and keeping distinctions, um, because that's what Scripture does. Uh, keeps things distinct from one another so we don't blend and confuse our theology uh, because we wouldn't want to blend and confuse what God's Word says. Right, and, and we and don't want is... to blend and confuse and confuse the brethren and the brothers whom we're, right. we're supposed to be loving and, and, you know, and we are doing these things, uh, right. speak the truth in love. So Going right, yeah. going right back to the, where we started, that you know, all of this is for the sake of the neighbor who hears the confession. That no. the neighbor's conscience needs to be appeased, and all right. of this distinctions and stuff is for the good of the neighbors. So they know that they do not have to, have to mix their works into their justification, but yet also can rejoice that God is working with them, uh, and yes, growing them throughout their life. This is, of course, catechism stuff. You know, drowned and die the old Adam should be. You know, mortification of the flesh, new man arise to emerge. Right, this kind of language. Right. All right, so that wraps up Article 20 on good works uh, in the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. We'll hand off the baton next week. I think Pastor Smith will be here again to go through the next article, 21, on the invocation of the saints. And so you've been listening to Concord Matters here on KFU AM Radio, the messenger of the good news. Realize that your justification is freely given to you for the sake of Christ Jesus. And uh, that is the central message of what we Lutherans believe, teach, and confess. The Lord bless all of you as you go on with the rest of this week and find yourselves in church on Sunday.